So welcome to our webinar on Inclusive Early Childhood Classrooms, Adult Guidance and Scaffolding. My name is Monica Lesperance and I direct the Include DC program here at the DC Special Education Cooperative. So this webinar is part of a series on early childhood inclusion that was developed by the DC Special Ed Co-op. We're a small nonprofit charter support organization here in DC. Um, charter schools choose to become members of our co-op so that their staff can access all of our support services and our resources, um, much like this one. Um, and at the co-op, our vision is that all students with disabilities in DC receive a rigorous, individualized, and inclusive education that prepares them for future success. So we work with the charter schools in DC to make that vision a reality. Um, and we do this in many ways, uh, including professional development and training on site, in person, and through webinar like this one. Um, through resource sharing and technical assistance on special ed, and also by facilitating collaboration among city agencies. So the Include DC program is one of the co-op's many programs. Um, Include is a course that we designed for general ed teachers to prepare them to work in inclusive classrooms. And Include is a course that can be taken for credit through Trinity University. In 2015, um, just over a year ago, we launched an early childhood version of the course through a partnership we have with Fight for Children. And thanks to Fight for Children, we were able to create this webinar series on early childhood inclusion. This is the fourth in a series of eight webinar that are based on the curriculum from our Include DC course. So this is just a little, a little snippet of, um, of what we focus on in the course uh, at a more in-depth level. So I want to highlight our Include DC uh, curriculum overall just to give you a high level so you can understand how this fits into the webinar series. Our curriculum is designed uh, to incorporate several evidence-based practices for inclusive classrooms. The curriculum is also closely aligned with the quality indicators in the Inclusive Classroom Profile Observation and Rating Tool, or the ICP, that you see a photo of here on the screen. The author of the ICP, um, Elena Sokogu, designed the tool so that observers could use it to rate the quality of a classroom's inclusive practices based on certain indicators. So our key areas of inclusive practice are based on those indicators and they are listed here on the screen. The first is uh, creating a welcoming and inclusive classroom climate and community. We also look at how teachers adapt space, materials, routines, and transitions in the classroom so that students can access the curriculum. We look at ways in which adults provide support and guidance to students during learning and play activities. And students with disabilities often present with behaviors that are challenging, so we look at ways that teachers can assist students in solving conflicts uh, and how positive behavior is supported. And finally, we focus on providing feedback to students with disabilities in supportive and productive ways, and also collaborating and communicating among the school team and families. So those are all the topics that we dive into in depth in our, our full semester long Include DC course. Um, and in this webinar, we're going to focus on just one of these key areas, and that is on adult guidance and scaffolding. So we're going to look through this webinar, probably about a half an hour, um, we're going to focus on some of the ways that teachers can provide that guidance and scaffold classroom activities to make sure that students with disabilities have access to the general ed curriculum and are able to participate in age appropriate activities. Before we look at some specific strategies, I want to bring our attention to how we define an inclusive classroom. Because this is a term that is used frequently, um, and everybody has kind of a different understanding of what it means. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So in our vision, when an individual classroom is inclusive, it means that all teachers in the room have shared responsibility for all students. So in a co-taught classroom, the general ed teacher and the special ed teacher are equals and are teachers of all children in that room. It's not just a shared classroom space, but it's really shared teaching. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the classroom activities are also designed so that all children can access the curriculum. 
And those students aren't just accessing, but are also receiving individualized supports to help them engage with materials and with their peers. And finally, students with and without disabilities are educated together. Um, they're participating in meaningful ways with their non-disabled peers in all activities. In our vision, inclusion isn't just about a location, but it's about an approach and a mindset. And I've highlighted the third principle here because it's the most connected to what we're looking at in this webinar today. To us, this means that all the adults in the room, no matter what their role, are guiding students and providing scaffolding to make sure those students can participate in meaningful ways in all classroom activities. Okay, and I see we have a question. All right, it looks like we're not, um, you're not able to see the visuals. Okay, let me see if I can do some um, maneuvering here to see what's going on. Okay, I'm going to put you on hold just for a second and see if I can um, go back and see what's up with the screen. Hold on a minute. All right, I think that I have fixed it. Um, let me know if you can see it now, if you guys could. Let me see if I can toggle through and see if I can get you to see it. Okay, so you should see a slide that says the inclusive general education classroom. All right, sounds like it is up. Okay, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I can scroll back through so you can see where we are. You didn't really miss much. So um, at the end of the webinar, too, I can go ahead and send you um, the, a copy of the slides so that you'll have them. So I apologize for that. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. OK. So hopefully you can see a picture of a brain on your screen. If you can't see a picture of a brain, please type it into the chat box and let me know. Make sure that you're still with me. Okay, it looks like we can all see the brain. Okay, so what is scaffolding? Um, scaffolding probably isn't a new concept for most educators. Um, it's just the supports that we as teachers put in place to help our students learn. Uh, really everything that we do as teachers to make sure our students can be successful are types of scaffolding. Um, and this image of the brain with scaffolding around it is exactly what we're doing in the classroom, right? We're creating access to the curriculum for struggling students. Um, in order to do that, we're going to put the supports in place for our students' brains to learn best. So why is scaffolding so important? Well, we want our students to have meaningful interaction with materials, with their peers, and with the activities in our classroom. Just because students are in the room and side by side with their non-disabled peers, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily engaged in learning activities with those peers. The scaffolding that we put in place allows those students at all levels of development to interact with the curriculum at their level in a meaningful way so that they're really getting something out of it. And of course, all good teachers are doing this naturally. So we're going to focus on a few evidence-based strategies for scaffolding in the early childhood classroom. We're going to talk briefly about modeling and prompting, child preference and choice, peer supports, and questioning and feedback. Sorry guys, I'm another technical difficulty. It looks like a slide is out of line. Okay, um, so prompting. Prompting is a strategy for scaffolding or adapting in early childhood. And prompts take many forms, uh, including verbal cues and hints, gestures, models of the target behavior, pictures, 
partial physical prompts and full physical prompts. So prompting is really useful because it cuts back on saying no or that's wrong. Um, we know that our students learn best from positive models. That is that they're more likely to respond to what to do examples versus the what not to do examples. Um, so by ensuring that they give the right response, we're supporting their learning. And you always want students to have the opportunity to think and give the correct, appropriate response or behavior on their own. So prompting is really something you only want to use as necessary. We can get into a habit, certainly with our students who struggle the most, of over-prompting, where we're almost putting answers in their mouth or, um, or, or prompting them before they have an opportunity to struggle with the concept a little bit. And so it's really something that you want to be aware of um, and just just check yourself and think about how frequently you're prompting and making sure you're not um, taking away the student's opportunity to answer without a prompt. So when it's appropriate to prompt is when you've posed um, a question or the child is attempting to engage in, act in an activity um, but gives no response or freezes. And this is, of course, after you've given some wait time for them to process that information. We use a lot of language with young children and a young child with a disability, if their language development is impacted, it might take them a little bit longer to process what you've asked them. Um, or they might not have the vocabulary or the language skills to understand that question or that directive thoroughly. Um, so you want to give them a little time to process. And then if there's no response, that would be an appropriate time. Um, it would also be appropriate if the child is about to um, give an incorrect response or um, show the incorrect uh, behavior for an activity. Um, and then also after they've given the incorrect response or they've already performed the inappropriate behavior, um, then you want to prompt with the correct behavior or the expected behavior. And there are many ways to look at prompting. Um, I'm going to break it down into the three ways that you could interact with a child who's in need of a prompt. Um, so we usually talk about visual, auditory, or physical prompts. Um, the visual prompts are picture clues. Um, so for example, this is when you're putting all your great environmental visual supports into action. This is using your visuals as prompts uh, when you point to your visual schedule and ask the child to select a center to go to um, or where you use your visual schedule to prompt the child so that they know what's coming next. You might also use a visual prompt during a color matching activity. Uh, for example, if you want a child to, to be able to identify um, a red block, the color red, so you might ask them to select the red block. And then if, if at this point they're not responding or they're about to pick the wrong block, then you might point or gesture to the red one to prompt them to give the correct response. So these are things we're doing very naturally, right? Just um, the, physical, the visual prompts for, for all kinds of situations. A model is also a visual prompt, so if you're creating some kind of a project and you show the child an example of what the project should look like when it's complete, um, then that model itself is a visual prompt. Auditory prompts are anything that includes sound, so sound cues, uh, you might use a certain sound to prompt a child that it's time for the next activity. A lot of classrooms use music to come to circle uh, or a song that signifies a transition. Those are examples of prompts. Um, using the example of the child who you were asking to select the red block, a verbal hint or verbal suggestion, um, the hint would be if you say, what color is that block? And the child isn't responding and you might um, start the word red by giving them the first sound. So red, red. Um, you might also say it's the same color as a stop sign, so you're giving a, a verbal suggestion or a hint. Um, so another example of a verbal suggestion would be just giving the answer choices. So is that block blue or is that block red? You've given them um, the vocabulary to choose from. So visual prompts, auditory prompts. And then physical is a, is a little more straightforward, I think. Um, that's when you are physically moving the child or providing hand-over-hand -hand assistance to complete the task. So an example of this might be taking a child's hand to walk them to line. 
um, or taking a child's hands and clapping them together during a song um, or doing hand over hand assistance with that child to, to prompt them to do the movements for a song you do during circle time. Prompting can be a very useful scaffolding tool during pretend play or free play. And I think that's an area where we don't use them often enough. You know, we tend to kind of let children do their thing when we're having, um, having some unstructured time. Um, but that's a time when a lot of students with disabilities uh, struggle. And so um, this is beyond prompting to get the right answer, but prompting to help a child sustain their play um, or finish building a tower or acting out a play scenario. Um, students with disabilities do tend to have a hard time during our more unstructured times during our day, which are important times of day for them to develop. Um, so it's an opportunity to, to give them a little more support. And I would say that most classrooms that I go into to visit, there's at least one student that doesn't know how to engage in free play. This would be the child that goes from center to center uh, and doesn't stay longer than a minute or two. Maybe he goes to dramatic play and wanders, picks up materials, but doesn't really play um, and mostly ends up getting into conflicts with others. This is the kind of child that can really benefit from a scaffolded play scenario. So some ways that you can do this are to create the scenario for the child. Um, so maybe in the dramatic play area, you have um, a kitchen center and there's, there's um, a washing machine. So you might um, help the child act out a washing clothes scenario or a cooking dinner scenario, or maybe it's driving a car to pick up my friend scenario. And then you would take the time to break down that scenario for the child. You know, the first step is you ask your friends who wants to ride in my car. The next step is you get in the driver's seat and then you tell everyone to buckle up, start the car, pretend to drive, etc. And you could use verbal or visual cues to help that child through that play scenario. It can be a little bit adult intensive, um, but if you do have some adult support in your room, that's a, a great way to use um, a classroom assistant um, as the lead teacher, an opportunity for you to really engage with the student that's struggling. Um, or you can create some visual cues that you hang in your center um, and obviously practice with the child in advance, but as an opportunity for them to learn some steps and to create a plan that they can follow through with. Our next strategy is child preference and choice. Uh, I like this quote up at the top. It's from um, the, one of the reference materials I use in my class. Um, active learning for children with special needs. So it says children are intentional learners who learn best from activities they themselves plan, carry out, and review. Um, and I think often in our curriculum we don't have enough opportunities for students to do that, that planning um, themselves. We, we do a little too much directing. So the way that you use this strategy um, is, is to, um, I'm sorry, is to help the students make those choices and also using their own interests and their own choice to direct them to other activities. So not unlike adults, children are going to learn more when they're motivated and interested in the topic. Uh, they're much better able to take in information when they're motivated, um, when they're calm, and when they're genuinely interested. They're also going to stay engaged longer and make more connections if they're focused on a task that they're genuinely interested in. So this can sometimes be a challenge with a highly structured curriculum, but there are always ways to start to embed choice into your routines. At the very, very basic level, we need to be able to create opportunities for our students to make choices in their daily activities. So which center they're going to go to um, or which materials they'll use when they get to the center. Um, and often by using a preferred item or activity, you can encourage a child to try something new or sustain their play uh, for longer than usual. I'm going to apologize because I am developing a cold and I can hear my voice starting to go. Um, sorry. <clears throat> okay, uh, so identifying and using preference. Um, so you can't just decide this is what the child is into, so this must be their preference, we're going to go with this. There is a system to figuring out what it is that is going to work. 
Um, so that's obviously by observing and listening to your students, right? You can get a really good sense of what their behavior is telling you, which then will allow you to start to match activities to their stage of development. Uh, and this is not to say that you should be tailoring everything that you do in your classroom to your child, to your students' preferences. Like, we can't all just do what we want to do all day long. They do need to learn to engage in their non-preferred activities. Um, but, but depending on your goal for the student, using preference can be really eye-opening. It's also a great way to engage students in a new activity that you haven't been successful with before. Um, so if you have students who are struggling or your students um, with disabilities who maybe only focus on one, uh, one type of center or one type of task, this is a way to use whatever they're really into as a link to a new activity. And preference, it doesn't have to be an object. It might be that the student prefers certain areas of, of the classroom or to be with certain peers or certain adults. Uh, one teacher that I worked with had a student that only wanted to go to the block center. Um, that's all he ever wanted to do. They did have a lot of choice during their day and any opportunity he had, that's what he chose to do. So she worked really hard to try to engage him in the other classroom activities. And the way that she did this was by using his natural interest and preference for blocks. So she started by getting him to go to the art center. She would first have him build a tower and then gradually convince him to draw or paint a picture of his tower so that he would start to use the art materials, which he wasn't really comfortable with. Um, and eventually he then became more comfortable with those materials and would draw and paint other things besides his block towers. On the flip side, if you have a student that loves painting and avoids all the other centers, you can use those paint brushes to engage them in the other activities. So painting for pre-writing activities um, or encouraging them to pretend paint in the dramatic play center or to pretend paint a tower that they build in the block center. Um, so it's really an opportunity to, um, to try to draw a child out of their comfort zone and into another area of the classroom. Um, another example might be if you have a child who doesn't engage with peers at all uh, and you're really working on, on getting them to engage with um, other children in the classroom, you, but maybe this child loves riding tricycles, you could motivate that child to ask others to join him on tricycles or pretend to be cars in a train um, or create a situation where that child has to ask another child to help him get a tricycle out of storage or um, move something out of the way. It's really just about using your creativity and what you know about your students to engage them. So the next strategy on our list for today is peer support. Um, this is a fancy way of explaining something again that happens very naturally in early childhood. Children learn so much from their peers and even though it happens naturally, if you start to be really explicit about how you are encouraging that peer support, then the outcomes are greater. So there, there are a couple, um, a couple types of peer support that we look at in our class and one is the proximity, one is the peer as the initiator, um, and the third is the peer to prompt and reinforce. So this first way is by having your typical peer be a model. Um, the child that, this, this child can then demonstrate the behaviors that you want your other children to engage in. So for example, if you're working in small groups on a literacy activity, you might seat a student who is strong in that area next to a student who has trouble with the materials or following steps. This way, there's a strong peer model right in close proximity to your struggling student. Um, the second would be having the a peer initiate a social interaction. So you're, you're creating a structured opportunity for that child to interact in a positive way. And an example of this might be teaching your typically developing peer to invite a child to play or join them in an activity. And a good place to use this strategy uh, is with the student who's hesitant to try new things or isn't sure how to join free play. It can be particularly helpful on the playground when it's kind of a free-for-all um, that might be overwhelming to a child with a disability. And the third way to use peer support is um, to have your peer be your prompter and reinforcer. 
um, to use this strategy, the teacher would show the peer how to respond uh, to the, the child who's struggling so that they're reinforcing a desired behavior um, or prompting the child to complete a task. Um, and an example of this might be showing one peer how to welcome a child into a group to play, uh, and that's going to reinforce the child who asks to join. So you're working on, um, you're trying to scaffold a play scenario for a student, and the student who is struggling, you're working with them on asking to join play or, or asking to join in, and the reinforcement is going to be the peer who says, yes, here, you can sit next to me, and this is how we're going to play. Um, so they're really natural scenarios that you can kind of, you can kind of force um, to go in the direction you want them to go in uh, if you're really thoughtful about it. Uh, one last thought on peer models before we go to the next uh, strategy. Uh, selecting a peer model isn't always just choosing the student who does something well. Uh, the personality and demeanor of your students play a large part, and you really want to be able to mix it up, right? You can't always rely on the most verbal child to be the only one doing the initiating. Um, so just being really thoughtful about how you're pairing up your models. All right, our next strategy is feedback. So adult feedback is a key factor in student learning. All students need to receive some form of positive feedback for their efforts during the day. High fives, good job, way to go, etc. are all really useful and good forms of positive feedback, but what's really going to solidify learning for your students is process-oriented feedback, um, and that is praise of the students' thinking process and efforts, um, so more specific praise. And this is something that we talk about a lot in um, in professional development about how we're, we're using praise with students and you know making sure that we're um, framing our praise appropriately so that the students are learning from it. And so some examples of, of positive feedback are things like, good job, awesome, I like your picture. And some examples of process-oriented feedback would be, I can see you're trying really hard to build a tall tower. And wow, you used your words to share with friends. So you see the difference. It's, they're both positive, but one is really explicit about um, praising the child's efforts in their learning. So um, I talked about this in my class with my Include students last night. Um, we all probably think that we're, we're doing a nice balance of process and positive feedback. Um, but when you go back to your classrooms, take some time to really notice which type of feedback you're using most often with your students generally, and then which type of students, which type of feedback you're using with your students with disabilities. So you want to compare and make sure that you're not defaulting to only using this kind of standard positive feedback with your struggling students. Uh, we do tend to fall into the habit of if a student is really struggling, just praising anything that they do, right? Because we want to we want to keep them motivated, we want to keep them moving. Um, but really trying to shift that feedback to be more process oriented is going to be more beneficial for the student in the long run. So this is a question I get all the time, but wait, isn't this all just good teaching? So I get this question all the time from experienced educators. Isn't a lot of what we share rooted in common sense and doing what we instinctively know is good for children? And my answer is yes, all of this is good teaching. Much of what you're probably already doing um, on some level. So that's the good news because it means that you're most of the way there. To me, the key difference is in the proactive planning um, that you're doing based on the specific needs of your students versus the reactive solutions to a problem that's presented. So becoming more inclusive in your practice really means considering the needs of your students in the planning levels and making sure you're providing the just right level of support so that your students can get the most out of every day. It's taking all these great ideas that you know exist and really thinking about them in advance and how you're going to use the strategies to make sure that your students who are struggling have access and are really engaging in your classroom activities in meaningful ways. <coughs> so
So as we wrap up this session, um, and before I open it up to any questions that you have, we have a few questions for you to ask yourself about your scaffolding practices. So these are some questions that you can use to help create an action plan for making those small changes in how you support your students with disabilities. So some of the questions that we want you to go back and ask yourself are, are all my students engaged during whole group times? And when we say all students, we mean all students. Are all of your students engaged during small group times or centers? Or do you have students that are kind of wandering? Um, do I provide guidance and scaffold free play? What kind of supports are you providing for your students during those unstructured times? Outdoor time, recess, um, free choice centers, things like that. Am I intentional and thoughtful in selecting peer models and supports? I'm sure everybody's doing this, but are you really being thoughtful about it? Uh, do I support students with disabilities in their communication with peers? Um, this isn't one that we got into in this particular webinar, but really making sure that you're um, finding ways to support your students in, in engaging with their peers, so asking questions, solving problems, things like that. And then what kind of feedback am I giving my students with disabilities? Um, positive feedback or process-oriented feedback or no feedback at all, um, which is likely not the case. So just some thoughts to take back to your classroom as you start thinking about refining your practice. So we have a few next steps and resources. If you're looking for more training on inclusion in early childhood, We've archived our recorded webinar from this series, and you can find them on our website, um, which is up here on your screen. We have uh, two more in, in this series in the spring. I believe the next one is in March. Um, and then we'll have another one probably in May or June. Uh, if you'd like to read more about inclusion in early childhood, uh, NACI is a good resource. This is an article here. Um, you can see the web address up on your screen um, that you could share with your colleagues, uh, really just about how to um, implement in inclusive practices in an early childhood classroom. I know I didn't get too deep into the details about process-oriented feedback, so I have a link here um, from mindsetkit.org that has some more specific examples and rationale and links to some of the research. And then finally, we um, will be hosting our full-length Include DC course next year. We haven't finalized the dates yet, um, but the best way to stay informed would be to sign up for our Include DC mailing list, where we'll share any upcoming opportunities um, and information about the cohort, the next cohort of Include, if you're interested in that. So that is it for me. Um, I'm going to hang out here for a few more minutes to answer any questions you might have. If you have no questions, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you'll join us again next time. And I apologize for our uh, brief technical difficulties and my oncoming cold, um, but please let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to hang out here, um, and thank you so much for joining us.